I'm Emily Lent, and I believe with my whole heart and soul that our homes are places where we can seek and love the truth, celebrate beauty, and learn good things every single day. That's why I'm educating my kids at home, and I know you can do it too. Welcome to Heart and Soul Homeschool. Well, I'm really happy to have with me today Chris DeGaulle. He's a friend. We go to church together, yeah. and you work here at the Herzog Foundation. So before we jump in, tell our audience just a little bit about who you are and what you do. Well, thanks. It's good to see you. Good to be here. Um, you and I, yeah, we've been friends for a long time, and uh, so when we both came to the Herzog Foundation. I think we shared similar goals. Uh, you are a homeschool mom. Uh, Christine and I are parents of uh, a daughter we just put in Christian school. And so when we joined the Herzog Foundation, they asked us to create a, a podcast to talk about that, you know, making the leap. And so that's what we did here uh, along with you. Now, for the better part of my career, I have been 25 years in mostly radio, some radio, some TV. And uh, I do a lot of politics and news for the most part. So this has been a welcome departure to talk about something sometimes that I think is a little more constructive. Yeah, but there's a lot of crossover we're finding at this Today, time. Yeah. And I'm embarrassed to admit that, and you know this, because we, we've talked about this before. Years ago, when I got into politics and started talking about that, I didn't, I, I saw uh, school as something else. Mm -hmm. Kind of like I saw church as something else. Right. And I really had them in three different, you know, yeah, Kind of neat, tidy silos. little boxes. Yeah. They're really all now intertwined, whether I wanted them to be, or maybe they always were, and I was just naive. Mm -hmm. But now I know um, church is school, is politics. Mm -hmm. I, they do have a lot to do with one another. Yeah. I mean, our eternity is our focus, of course, but mm -hmm. uh, how our kids are taught and who's teaching them matters. Yeah, absolutely. And in the homeschool world, we say a lot, education is discipleship. Yes. And when I started learning that, it just absolutely blew my mind. But any type of, of educating and learning really is discipl we're discipling our kids along the path that ultimately you, you and I hope leads to a strong faith. But that... I think more and more people are waking up to that. Yeah, I do too. But at homeschool folks, and you know this because you come from that world, it's like people that have been doing this for decades, they were onto something well before I even thought about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, well before I had kids and certainly while I was in school, I, there was just never in my mind, I was never thinking about school being a place uh, where my kids are... Uh, out of my control. Mm -hmm. I thought that everyone in a school shared my values. Yeah, it's just what we did for yeah. so long. It was the status quo. And so what you were just saying about everything kind of being intertwined is actually a really good segue into what I wanted to talk to you about today. So you are a member of the media yeah. yourself, yeah. for better or worse. I right? know, I know. Um, but, but media is such a big deal right now. As you and I sit here, we're in the middle of a presidential election mm -hmm. season. Um, there is a lot of talk right now about censorship on you know TV, social media, all of those things. Um, there are new terms. You know, Donald Trump kind of <laughs> coined fake news, mm -hmm. but now there are new terms cropping up, malinformation. You know, what, what even is all this <laughs> stuff? It is such a, such a tough thing to navigate. Yeah. And yet I think because everything is intertwined, right? truth as Christians should just be paramount to us. And so we need to walk through this with our kids and teach them discernment. It's just, I can't overstate the importance of what my husband and I are coming to the conclusion that that's important in our parenting. I heard, That's so well said. I heard a reporter just this morning, actually, mm -hmm. talking about kids today, teenagers are growing up and they, this reporter specifically said, they don't know who to trust. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, boy, if that's not biblical, if that's not scriptural, yeah. you know, I yeah. mean, that's the point when, when kids feel so inundated and they're mistrustful of everything, what is truth? Where is their truth? Where's their center? Their true north? Well, yeah. and, and that's true. I mean, we are getting to a place where, I mean, I know it's with my own sons, mm -hmm. they, they believe virtually nothing. I mean, mm -hmm. things that I took for granted that were true. I mean, they will, they will openly say things like, eh, are you sure? Uh, yeah. about the Kennedy assassination or the moon yeah. landing, Some, sometimes joking, but you know, these are things that they consume all the time on social media yeah. and they're 19, 18 years old. Mm -hmm. now. And they've grown up in a time, I think, you know, we, we can't deny that COVID changed everything. It is so pervasive. Yep. I think my husband and I talk a lot about how the way we parent and the way we live our lives, it impacted us in yes. a way um, that I think we don't know the full effect of yet. And there are so many people who say, you know, oh, it's over, it's done, let's just move on. But we're just finding, not that we need to rehash every part of it, but there are those lingering things, right, that have made us, I think in a good way, uh, yes. uh, uh, question things a little bit. Completely. It made me rethink everything that I thought I knew. Uh, I have heard people warn that now that we're post-COVID, things have returned to normal. I have heard people say, well, maybe 
we can leave Christian school and get back to public school. Or maybe I don't need to homeschool anymore. Yeah. Now things have evened out. And that's what I hope doesn't happen. Yeah. Is that culturally we don't fall back into those same old traps. Mm -hmm. Well, we're back to normal now. Mm -hmm. I mean, what COVID I, I hope exposed to most of us is there are a lot of people that think they have rights to our children mm -hmm. and what what they believe and what they think and even who they become. And I didn't realize there was a, an element culturally that was interested in almost rearing our children until I read this banner at our kids' Christian school that says those who want our children the most will get them. Yeah. Easy sentence, but it's true. I never really thought about teachers or administrators or counselors looking at children as potential recruits yeah. for a movement in the future, but a lot of them do. Yeah, a lot of them do, sadly. And I think the alignment of institutions, you know, including the media, which is what we're going to talk about with the schools, with, you know, political administrations and causes, are all aligned to yes. try to get a hold of our kids. And so I think that's why it's so important for us to be on top of it as parents and to teach our kids to kind of recognize what's going on. So we're going to talk about later how we as Christian parents can really help our kids, you know, really dig into that. And how do we help them get through this time mm -hmm. and for the rest of their lives kind of lay that foundation. But if you don't mind, just because you probably know far more about this than I do, let's kind of set the stage for how we got here with the media. So, you know, the founders of our country set the mm. media up or allowed for a media that was independent yeah. of the government, which is so important. You know, it's kind of a check and balance. Yes. And then we've gotten all the way from there to <laughs> now where the media is literally colluding with our government. So kind of give us an overview. Yeah, literally. Um, I, you, you've framed it beautifully. I, I think what's so sad is the ultimate lifeguard, the guardrails of what we uh, know about our government was supposed to come from media. To see so many in the media now working in concert with government's really problematic anyway. But I know that, you know, as I was coming up and studying broadcasting, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, Rush Limbaugh was sort of the gold standard in talk radio, of course. Yep. Um, he was sort of the inventor of the format. Talk radio was really not a thing until he made it. Uh, and, and he, I think... People may disagree with this, but I think he was probably the first national figure to point to media and say, do you see what's going on here? Mm -hmm. I hear all the time people say, I miss the days when there were three television networks, when it was Peter Jennings and yeah. Tom Brokaw and Dan Rather, and that's mm -hmm. it. And uh, somehow we conditioned ourselves to all think, well, those three guys on those three networks are telling us the truth every night. Right. Not and really. they legitimately did. That's what you and I were kind of talked about this a little bit before we hit record here. But over, so I'm 40. I don't know if you want to say how old 47, you are. yeah. Um, but, but this change in media has really happened during our adult lifetime. It has. Like, I, I remember this happening. So when I was young, every night, like clockwork, my parents would tune into, they watched Peter Jennings. Yep. Um, Me too. You know, I mean, what a what a crazy thing to think about now. But that was literally how they got their news. We didn't have the internet yet. We had Rush Limbaugh, you know, a little bit of talk radio. Yes. And my, my family was conservative, which is probably no surprise to anyone <laughs> who listens to my show. Um, but it seems so much simpler in hindsight yep. than it is now. There wasn't just this barrage, this constant influx. There was no such thing as social media. None. No. So it was TV and, you know, literal newspapers. Mm -hmm. There really wasn't even the internet until, what, late 90s or yeah. 2000s. So, you know, Rush was the first person that I heard say, you know, that Peter Jennings guy, mm -hmm. he has an agenda. Yeah. And I always thought, what do you mean Peter Jennings has an agenda? He's just the stately news guy. Right. Um, it was 9-11 for me. Mm -hmm. My wake-up moment was 9-11, which we're, you know, here as you and I talk, we're talking in the anniversary period of 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the first time when I heard him get irritated. Peter Jennings got irritated at the Toby Keith song yep. um, <laughs> uh, about uh, putting the boot up the, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, going out there and ringing the bell of freedom and yeah. going and taking it to the terrorists. Mm -hmm. And Peter Jennings, I remember, admonished that one night, not too terribly long after it had happened. And the, na the nation is angry and we're sorrowful and we want answers and yeah. we want to get even with the people that did it. And here's this guy on TV saying, oh, that's so unbecoming. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I thought, that's not how an American news anchor should be talking to his audience. Mm -hmm. You it should understand that. patronizing at the time. Yes. And I think people, weren't they mailing in boots and things to kind of prove a point that they, <laughs> yeah. they didn't appreciate that? Yes. Um, I'm with you. That was kind of a first eye-opening thing to me. Um, I went to intern in Washington, D.C. in okay. 2004. So right in that time period where patriotism was high. Um, and that was kind of my first look into it, mm -hmm. where one thing would happen right in front of my eyes. Yep. And then I would go home and watch the news or read the newspaper and thought, like, that, that isn't what down. I saw happen. That wasn't what I heard said. 
And you could kind of see during those Bush years, Mm -hmm. um, like I would call it a bias, Mm -hmm. wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. But certainly not the polarization that we see now. No. And what we're seeing now, too, is the the pace of news, Mm -hmm. what is almost breathless and difficult for me to even keep up with, and it's what I do every day, is what in the world do we talk about in the spate of things that have happened in a 24-hour period? And I think that's done on purpose. That really started happening during the Obama era Mm -hmm. when it was just foot on the gas pedal and it felt like every single day and week there was something year-round. There used to be times in talk radio, I remember, where we would hit the summer and it would slow down. Mm -hmm. We'd hit the holidays and it would slow down. After the election, it would slow down. Mm-hmm. It's just churning, constant, constant. And I think there's a method to that. I think I there's a method to the madness. What's your theory on that? What keep, do you... keep us busy, keep mm-hmm. us talking, keep us distracted. You never know what the other hand's doing. It's mm-hmm. it's the classic shell game. Mm-hmm. Right? And it makes you tired, right? Exhausted. It, until it, you're defeated yeah. and disgusted. And you, what? Disconnect. Right. Exactly. And you stop participating. Yeah, and you just say, I'm just going to watch football. I'm just going to you know, go out on the boat an extra time. I'm just going to exactly right. whatever, fill in the blank. Because it's tiring. Yeah, Human it's beings exhausting. aren't meant to consume things like that. Right. And so it can defeat people. Now you add in on top of that, I don't trust our elections anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have a whole population that thinks, ah, voting, it's rigged. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you can see where um, bad people gain control mm-hmm. when you have a whole population that's dispirited and feels like they don't matter. Yeah. Yeah. So as we, as we think about all of this, so there's you and I who have kids, you know, your, your youngest just turned 16 and my youngest just turned five. So we're kind of at opposite ends of the parenting spectrum. Mm -hmm. But as we think about this as parents who are guiding kids through this time, we can't afford to be exhausted. Can we? We've got to stay in there. We've got, we've got to overcome this somehow. And so you know, you are in the position of sifting through enormous amounts of information and then kind of deciding what you're going to put out there Mm -hmm. to your audience who trust you. So how do you do that, Chris? How do you decide this is what I'm going to put before these people who are looking to me? Yeah, a tough question. Uh, First, I mean, just as a practical matter, I look at the news and I look at things that, um, interest me. I mean, I can't really do a show that's not interesting to me. Sure. So there's some bias, I have to say. I, can't, I don't necessarily have a grasp of everything there is to talk about out there, so I have to kind of talk about what, under, what I understand. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I now, today, with a more biblical lens, I'm starting to look at things through the context of uh, what is this doing to our souls mm-hmm. and our kind of our national conscience? Yeah. Um, and how is it eating at us internally? I'm really more mindful of that now. I don't like people talking about elections like, the end of the world is coming. Right. I, and I feel like I used to be a part of that a lot. I think it used to almost be like, for me personally, I don't want to speak for you, but almost like my NFL. Like yep. it was, it was kind of a fun game but it was to fun. observe. Yeah. It wasn't this vitriolic, or- nasty, we can't get together. I mean, you, you were just talking again before we hit record here. Tell that story that you, about Elton John that you were just talking about. Well, That's right. a great example. It's a perfect example. Uh, somebody asked Elton John recently what he thought about Donald Trump giving Kim Jong-un, the North Korean dictator, uh, his CD of Rocket Man. Of course, Trump calls uh, Kim Jong-un little Rocket Man. Right. And so... Uh, Elon Musk was asked, what does he think about that? Elon, or uh, not Elon Musk, I'm sorry. Um, Elton John. <laughs> no, yeah, Elton John. <laughs> See, but all of these people, that's what's so fascinating too, culturally. You have Elon Musk and Joe Rogan and RFK Jr. and Tulsi yeah. Gabbard and all these people that didn't used to be... Strange bedfellows. Right? Yeah. And Elton John displayed, for instance, in this conversation, you know what? I don't I don't mind it. I, uh, Donald's come to several of my concerts. I think it's funny. He seems like a nice guy. You know Elton John doesn't vote for Donald Trump, but I like him. He seems like a nice enough guy, and he played Rush Limbaugh's wedding, as we were talking about. I don't think Rush and Donald Trump have much in common with Elton John, but Elton John's not a nasty person. Right. He's just a He's friendly an entertainer. guy. Yeah. And he says, if they like me and they like my music, great. They seem like nice guys. Okay, we don't vote alike, but that's it. So, yes, you're right. There used to be an element of almost kind of fun. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I listen to Rush... You know, Bill Clinton, there were parody songs, and it was kind of funny. It didn't feel as consequential, the gravity to it now. Everything feels like it's this or else. And personal. Yes. It's, it's much more personal than it used to be. Yes. Um, which, again, is fascinating and as I'm listening to you talk. so And I feel like we're talking about Rush Limbaugh a lot, but it's a really good kind of cultural, um, I don't know, just monument, I guess, when you think, or marker. 
um, when you think about it, because he was different yep. and he was a unifying force, not between the left and the right, but it was something that, that people, um, you know, who might've had a similar belief system could kind of gather around every day. That uh -huh. doesn't even exist <laughs> like within. And so like, while I don't want this conversation to be political, yep. everything, I guess that's my point is everything about the news feels political now and it didn't used to. I have had this discussion a lot with people in our business. With Russia's death, what happened in conservative media was it just splintered in a thousand mm -hmm. ways. And so everybody became, and certainly the advent of YouTube, and now everyone does their own show. Mm -hmm. Everyone's talking about And politics. podcasting really rose up kind of at the same time, which allowed kind of those gatekeepers that used to be in place. There aren't I mean, None. look, I'm, I'm doing a podcast now, Chris. No, thought? yeah, no, and that's but, great. But and, it's comical. And so, well, no, but here's the thing. It's like you can have one of two thoughts about it. Um, are there people that I think are kind of reckless and irresponsible that are saying really reckless things and have built an audience being reckless? I do. Yeah. I think they're loathsome people building pretty healthy audiences saying really nasty stuff. Yeah. Uh, that isn't helpful and has young people believing it's true. I think it's awful and it's not exclusive to people on the left, I'll say. But um, the thing about it too is, here's the other side, are we better off with having this widely divergent, diverse sea of information that you can listen to and consume, shop, compare? Mm -hmm. um, when I hear people say, I just wish someone were here to tell me the truth, I always say, well, I don't know that anybody but our savior can say that. I mean, mm -hmm. unless it's written in scripture, I don't think any human being should be assigned your truth teller, right? Right. You need right. to kind of shop and compare and do your own homework. So mm -hmm. I'm not uncomfortable with it, but you do kind of wonder, are people, how are people getting educated? And there is, there is, doesn't seem to be, Obama said once, we need a common set of facts. Well, I don't know who dictates whose common set right. of facts we're working off of, right? right? It's great if it's your, if it's your facts that are being, <laughs> you know, put out there. If it's not your facts, yeah. you know, things get a little dicey, which I think honestly is kind of where we're at right now. Which goes back to homeschooling. Frankly, right. I mean, you're going to teach your children what, what you know to be factually true. Right. And then I and guess hopefully they give them a plumb line. Yes. You know, that's, that's the thing. And we're going to talk more about that kind of in the second half of our conversation. But before we move on to that, are, I mean, are there any neutral news sources anymore? I don't think so. I couldn't think of any. I, I want to believe that I do in every way that I know how I try to be honest with the audience and I try to tell the truth as I understand it and know it and mm -hmm. as I believe it. Am I biased toward a candidate or a political party? I am, but I'm not, I never, ever would go on the air and knowingly lie about what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe I find later I'm wrong. The responsibility on me then is to, do I have the humility? Dare I go back to the air and say, you know what? Yesterday I was pounding my fist about this thing and I got it wrong and I'm sorry. Yeah. That's, we're really lacking that yeah. these days. But intent. It's totally different, yeah. you know, yeah. because when we go out intending just to stick to a narrative that we believe to be true, whatever, whatever the cost of that may be. Even if whether, we learn new things. Yes. That's, challenge. I think, what, what I see happening a lot on all sides. Uh, absolutely. For instance, uh, you talk about the Bush era, the, you know, the war on terror. When I first started getting into talk radio and talking about that stuff, it was, let's get the terrorists. Um, let's uh, create a Department of Homeland Security. Yeah. You bet. Yeah. 20 something years later, I say, oh boy, you know what? Maybe there was something to those people that said, maybe we don't want to grow government and have them looking at us and spying mm -hmm. on us. And I didn't used to think government was bad. Yeah. I trusted it. Yeah, now, we were coming out of the 80s, you yeah. know, kids of the 80s, and America felt good. Yeah. Our government felt pretty good yeah. at the time. That's you know, right. we wanted to be patriotic. And I think, you know, that, that was very close to me. I worked in both Bush administrations. And that would go back to something I've learned in the last few years as we've kind of had this shift to like, eh, maybe we should question some things. Um, I realized that I was playing on a team. Yes. You know, and so I wasn't doing anything that I knew to be wrong at the time. And, and nothing that I specifically would say would be wrong now, but I supported things because it was my team. Yep. And instead of really looking honestly. And you know what else I think you and I are both somewhat guilty of? I'll speak for myself, but I think you fall into this a little bit. We were kind of political geeks, right? So uh, when I started really studying politics and interviewing politicians, I was sort of enamored with them like they were sort of celebrities. Mm -hmm. Ooh, there's Senator so-and-so. Yeah. And I had a friend um, in my young talk radio career who once said to me, you know, you really need to stop that. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, that, these people are not celebrities, they're public servants. Right. 
And when he said that, I really, it hit me between the eyes mm-hmm. that I, I've been deifying and celebrifying these people that are supposed to represent us. Yeah. And this kind of deference that they're stars is the wrong attitude to have. And so I've really tried to shake myself of that over the years. Yeah. And I think as we process then the information that they're putting out to us through the media, mm-hmm. you know, keeping that in mind, like who, who are they serving? What is this information that they're putting out? Is that, is that in service to the people or is it serving a bigger agenda? I mean, there, there's a lot to unpack. So I think we've done a pretty darn good job of setting the stage it's don't a big you? Topic. for where we're at. Huge I mean, topic. it's, we could talk about it all day. Yep. I feel like we could go on and on. There's just so much there, but let's kind of take a pause here you got and cut this in half. I mean, we'll right. come back next week and we're going to talk about, um, from a perspective of Christian parents, both of us, different ages of kids, but I think we would have similar intents in our families of what we want to raise our kids to be as we launch them Amen. into the world. So we're going to get back to that and kind of hopefully give you some encouragement and what what can we actually be doing. So um, thanks for being with us and I hope you'll come back next week for the next episode of Heart and Soul Homeschool. Heart and Soul Homeschool is a podcast presentation of the Herzog Foundation. The views and opinions expressed on the show are those of the host and guests and not necessarily the views of the Herzog Foundation. Be sure to like and subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode of Heart and Soul Homeschool.